we are back. And uh, we are now at chat less than 11. Less than 11. The four generations since 1844. Less than 11. Less than 11, we want to finish. You think we can finish less than 11? What's the time now? What's the time now? Quarter five? You think we can finish less than 11 by 5.15? Uh, you doubt? Let's, pr let's pray and go. You see, the reading doesn't take the time. It's here for the note table. It's take time so we can read and finish. Let's go. Heavenly Father, now as we are about to commence lesson 11, teach us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. So we're top of page 70. And we're moving smoothly. Everybody together, Nefertiti has joined us belatedly. She will have to give us an excuse in writing later on. Uh, page 70. Good. Let's go. I, this time I want more participation, so get that microphone mobilized and read clearly into it for the people who are viewing. I'm going to start. Prophetic time ended in October 22nd, 1844. Okay? Thereafter, it became a matter of which generation would allow our high priest to ripen his church for the harvest. So when did prophetic time end, Sister Supervisor? October 1844, at the end of the 2300 days. Thereafter... There is no time setting. It is a matter of which generation gets ripe in which watch. But we are to know the nearness, number one, and we are to hasten and make it happen by entire consecration. These passages you should know by heart. Tell me in your own words what Mark 4, 26 to 29 says. Uh, sister, where's the microphone? Tell me your own words, a synopsis of what Mark 4, 26 and 29 says, Sister Rhea. It, it gives the stages of growth of the corn, and it says first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. And then when that is full, then the harvest is ripe. So, and then the, the farmer puts in the sickle to reap the harvest. Okay, that's the harvest principle, good. Mm -hmm. And James 5, 7 and 8 tells us what to actualities are necessary for that harvest to be ripened? Sister Kalita? James 5, 7 and 8 says what does that harvest need in terms of rain to ripen it? Early and latter rain. Early and, and latter rain. rain. Early, Early and latter rain. Sister Kalita, you know that. Why? And Ephesians 4, 12 to 15 tells us what? We are to grow up to the measure of the stature of men and women in Christ, not blown about with every wind of doctrine, but growing up in the knowledge of the Son of God, you, into the unity of truth. And Revelation 14, 14 to 16, what does that say in your own words without looking it up? Sister Tayan. When the harvest is ripe, God shall put in his sickle and reap. And when the harvest is ripe, the sickle will be put in. I remember the synopsis. The Son of Man is coming on a cloud with a sickle, and another angel cries to him that assists on the cloud, trusting a sickle and reap. Now answer this question. Who is on the cloud with the sickle? Christ. And who tells him to put in the sickle and reap? The angel represents who? His people. His people. You know, in normal biology, if doctors don't interfere, it is the baby that produces the chemicals that signals that it's time to come out. Yes. So we, de yes, the baby determines when it's coming out. Because Joseph says yes? You got to be a doctor. I thought he was asking if he's a woman because the man that discovered it. <laughs> so the important thing is this. The church must not only be ripening, but we must so love the appearing that we eventually say, 
even so, Lord Jesus, come. All I know is in being sensible, you know. Being sensible. We pretending to talk about it. The church must reach the point where we say, say, even so, Lord Jesus, come and come quickly. Okay. First generation, 1844 to 1884. You know these generations, right? Good. First generation. Let's go. Now, uh, I want you to share the reading. So I'm going to tell you, get the microphone mobilized, and I'm going to tell you when to read. So, Sister Kalita, stand by. You're a good reader. Let's go. First generation, 1844, 1884. Christ could have and would have returned within the time frame of the first generation after 1844 had the Adventists of that generation become harvest ripe. You got that fact clear? Y'all weren't paying attention. Christ, I'm under the heading, first generation, 1844 to 1884. Christ could have and would have returned within the time frame of that first generation after 1844 had the Adventists of that generation become harvest ripe. Moreover, he could have returned early in that first generation. The timeline of that first generation was October 1844 to October 1884. Let us read now what Ellen G. Wright wrote in 1883, one year before that first generation ended. Listen, Sister Kalita, Evangelism 695-696, listen to what Ellen White says. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their rewards. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the, old, had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, and establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. For 40 years did unbelief, Murmuring and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Pause a minute, Sister Kalita. Everybody got these lessons? The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Continue. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Manuscript 4, 1883. So she was writing in 1883 and saying that they were in the world too long already and that was the first generation. Notice the things that keep us on belief. And that's the root. We don't believe God's promises to surrender. Worldliness. We want to be like all the other nations. Unconsecration and strife. What are the four things? Unbelief, worldliness, unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. And yet, yet you have people blaming the Lord that whenever he's ready, he will come and not understanding our responsibility to wipe him for the harvest. All right. Uh, Close off that section by reading them to look one for us, and then we go to another reader. In fact, in fact, rather than ripening to the air and then the full corn in the air, Adventists in that first generation lost sight of Jesus and became lukewarm. Whoa, you heard that? Lost sight of Jesus 
focus on human performance, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and became lukewarm. And let's find out when that lukewarm message was applied to them. Uh, first testimonies, testimonies volume 1186 paragraph 1, Sister Sherry Joseph. I was shown that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people at the present time. And the reason it has not accomplished a great work is because of the hardness of their hearts. But God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified from sin, which have so long shut out Jesus. This fearful message will do its work. When it was first presented, it led to close examination of heart. Sins were confessed, and the people of God were stirred everywhere. Nearly all believed that this message would end in the loud cry of the third angel. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effort of the message. I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months. It is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings, and to lead to zealous repentance, that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. All right. Notice there's always a delay in which delay the foolish virgins fall asleep. Now, if you hear that an exam is to come on September the 1st, okay, and you start preparing, and then you hear the exam get put back till December the 1st. What will most students do? Exactly. Ah, cool. What should they do? So you have more time now to get 100%. If before it was, if, if before it was going to barely scrape, I have more time now to get 100%. Okay? And you should always be prepared. I had an illustration. At university, we went on a hike. And when we came back, the other students in our classes, you all went on a hike. But the professor said, a test Monday morning, we went on a hike, the bank holiday, test Monday, Tuesday morning, bright and early, 8 o'clock. The next day. So everybody panicking. And one fellow said, Douglas, a St. Vincent fellow. We can wake up at 4 o'clock. You give me a tutorial, because I know you prepared. And we're going down at faith. I got up, gave my friend, Marshall, he's Dr. Marshall now there, and with Roy, a tutorial. I went down to the test. I get 89% and Marshall get 90. <laughs> Marshall said, boy, you should teach. But the point is, at least one of us was prepared. If not all of us, would have been cats bagged. So always be prepared. And if you hear the delay, double that preparation. But be a wise virgin in every area of your life. Good. All right, so that was the first generation. And rather than get ready, they became lukewarm. The second generation, 1884 to 1924, we're going to ask uh, St. Lucian at St. to read for us. Uh, who's, who's going to read for us? Uh, Sister Supervisor, read for us. <laughs> now you have to pronounce your words good because you're reading to an international audience so that people in Russia must understand you. Let's go. Early. Early in the second generation, within the first watch of that generation, in fact, in the year 1888, God sent a most precious message with the intention of curing Laodicean lukewarmness and quickly ripening the remnant church for the harvest. Pause. You see how, how heaven is always gracious? Heaven is always gracious. Lord, so look, let me wrap up things. Very early, let me wrap up things quick, quick, quick. So he sent the cure for lukewarmness, which will wrap up things. Continue. It was... It was a presentation of the true gospel of righteousness by faith and the covenants. 
The chosen messengers were E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. The place was Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the 1888 General Conference session. It was described by Sister E.G. White as the beginning of the revelation, 18, loud cry and lattering outpouring. It was a special visitation from our gracious Lord and acceptable year of the Lord for his people. You heard all that? Well, well, well. Heaven all gracious sent the message. Okay, Sister Cordell, next paragraph. Sadly, the message was not accepted by the church leadership of the day, and therefore it was largely kept away from the church members and the world. But throughout the first two watches of the second generation, in the year 1893, 1895, and 1901, heaven's graciousness continued to be extended, uh, what? Oh, albeit in vain. The watches in the second generation were as follows. All right, good. Let's look at these watches, everybody. The watches in that second generation, let's look at it. 1884 to 1894, watch one. And what happened in that watch? In 1888, just within four years, notice these numbers. Within four years, four is a significant number. God sent the message by Wagner and Jones. Watch two, 1894. To 1904, and all during that period, 1895 bulletin, all up to the 1901 general conference session, God was still sending the light and pleading. What three, 1904 to 1914? Well, you're in trouble because remember this, the iniquity of the first generation, or the first watch, is sown on the second and third. So what happened in 1915 as they start watch four? Anybody can tell me what's the give event? The prophetess died. She fell down at her old age of 87, broke her hip. And even today in modern medicine, if an old person breaks the hip, the chances of recovery, even if they get a pain put in, is that they're going to die. So in 1915, at the start of Watch 4, the prophetess died, and the rest is history. Generation 2, having rejected the 1888 message, did not ripen for the harvest. Let's continue here now. All through the period 1901 to 1913, Ellen White declared God's call for organizational reform, but in vain. The prophetess died in 1915. The second generation of the Third Angels Movement ended in 1924. The remnant church was nowhere ready being ripened for the harvest. Sad. And you can read the camp book for 2015 to get the details there. Good. The third generation, Sister Sharon Cave. Third generation, Sister Sharon Cave. From as early as the late 1920s, a phenomenon best called the acceptance myth began to develop. Church members were told that the church had accepted the 1888 message. Blatant false, so it was. The church was being leavened by the sardis virgin of the gospel and was not being exposed to the wonderful elements of the true gospel of that most precious 1888 you know, message. what's happening here? Certain authors started writing that the church had accepted the message and the members were not knowing because we over here in Barbados, we, we didn't hear it. We didn't know a thing about 1888. Nothing. Until we began to understand what was happening. All right, point two. But God was about to give to the General Conference another invitation to accept the 1888 message. In the 1950 General Conference session, Donald K. Shore and Robert J. Reland invited the GC to reconsider the 1888 message. They were asked to prove their charges. It, yeah. They were asked to prove their charges that the church had rejected the 1888 message. This led to their production of the manuscript, then known as 1888 Reexamined, 1950. 
and now known as 1888 re-examined, revised, and updated 1888 to 1988, the, the story of a century of confrontation between God and his people, 1987. The General Conference leadership made light of the invitation to study and accept the message, and they rejected the call for denominational repentances. In fact, Whedon and Short were admonished not to expose the matter or circulate the material. Okay, so you see, you see what is happening in that second generation? You see the gravity of what was happening? And most Adventists don't have a clue about this. Don't know. Point three, let me read point three. Then came the Evangelical Conferences, 1955 to 1957. And I was a little boy then. I was uh, five, six, seven, eight in that age group. Huh? Yeah, you were here. When at the Spite Stone Boys School in St. Peter Barbados, a teacher came teaching. Two teachers came teaching. A very pretty teacher called Audrey Boyce and another teacher called Halstead Howell. Now, you know, we little, little children, little children are very mischievous, you know. And they had another teacher called Mr. Thomas. And we knew, as tiny as we were, that Mr. Thomas liked. Miss Howell, like Miss Boyce. We knew that. He was always passing by our class and saying something to her. And we are eight, six, seven, and eight, going to tell, tell our parents this. You know why it's small? But then this teacher from, uh, this teacher has the Howell, to ask me to ask my mother if he could have lunch at us instead of going back to St. Lucie. In those days, there was no fast food, eat proper cooked food. So when he came and asked to eat for lunch, he asked my mother, can I take your son to Sabbath school? That time we were Sunday keeping, church of God, all sorts of Sunday keeping things. And my mother said once, it is the house of God? Yes. So I was now introduced to Adventism at that tiny tender age, seven to eight. Going to check all and hear men like Fitz Graves talking about Ellen White and Fred Graves and a true prophetess and so on. And from that early age, things started to stick in here, stick in here. And before anybody could prove to me anything about Ellen White, I had that conviction that she was a true prophetess. I tell people that if you are going to believe something, you don't wait for 100% proof. The Holy Spirit brings conviction early o'clock. Only to show things happen. And eventually, that same Miss Audrey Howell married Halster Howell's brother, Pastor Everett Howell. And the Howell family and my family became good friends up to now, Pastor Howell. And Halster Howell are my good friends, and the same Audrey. Yet yeah, I went and visited them and took the grandchildren. She said, well, 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 I used to teach you as a little boy at seven. I bring this grandchild at eight. But she's now in the 80s. She said, thank the Lord. So see how history goes. So the Lord caused paths to cross at particular times. There it is. All that time we didn't know what was happening. They didn't know, and I would know less because they were small. But listen to what was happening now. Then came the evangelical conferences where leading Adventist scholars met with Walter Martin and Donald Barnhouse. These meetings led to apostasy on the doctrine of the human flesh Christ took on in the incarnation because Martin was going to write a book called The Kingdom of the Cults and put the Adventist church in it as a cult. He was also going to put the Watchtower in it as a cult. Well, as much as we say about the Watchtower, it is said that when he, when he knocked at the Watchtower and said, we can put you in a book as a cult, can we talk? The Watchtower said, talk? You can put us in all the books you want as a cult, please leave. But when he came at us now and said, the fellow said, let's talk. I started to water down. Water down. All right. So these meetings led to apostasy on the doctrine of the human flesh. In other words, we know from the Bible that Jesus took on our corporate sinful fallen flesh and overcame it and lived a sinless character in life. He was tempted on all points as we are. If he didn't take on the same flesh I have, he couldn't be tempted the same way I am. But having sinful flesh doesn't make you a sinner. 
Because we have sinful flesh and we can overcome it by his grace. Okay? God doesn't say you are a sinner because you have sinful fallen flesh. It's when you yield your mind to the sin principle in it. And we have that victory in Christ. And they also began to confuse the atonement in the heavenly sanctuary. Top of page 73. Out of those evangelical conferences came the book Seventh-day Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine, containing serious error, but at that time popularly accepted as advancing light by many an Adventist, including me at that time as a young fellow. They didn't know. But thank the Lord. When he's leading you, he's leading you. The last point we shall mention here is best summarized by the Standish Brothers. Y'all remember the Standish Brothers? Yeah, the Standish Brothers we used to talk about in the early movement. They, they were reformers in America and Australia. The Standish Brothers, one a dentist and one a doctor. Listen, to, they have wrote a book called Half a Century of Apostasy. Here is a quote from page 31 of that book. The Barnhouse Martin Dialogue with the General Conference in 1956 opened a floodgate of ecumenism. It led to conversations with the World Council of Churches, where the Adventists have a representative, and has drawn us closer and closer in the web of unsanctified ecumenism. Half a century of apostasy by the Standish Brothers. There it is. So God had his watchmen all around saying, this isn't right. You watch where you're going. Okay. All right. So now we come. So that's the third generation. You see the third generation gone. And notice that in that third generation, God sent a second call. He joins on Wagner. Message with the first call. All things are already come. Now, in the 1950 General Conference, it was wheeling really short. And the fellas neglected again. Okay. Fourth generation, 1964 to 2004. That's our generation now. Uh, I was born in the... I was born in the third generation, 1940, October 4. Uh, but most of y'all here will, will have to be born in the, in the fourth generation, some early, some later. Anybody here born in the 60s? 60s. All the rest born, all the rest born. Yeah, yeah, the young girls here born yesterday. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go. Fourth generation, 64 to 2004. We're going to ask somebody to begin reading for us now again, uh, loudly and clearly. Pass the microphone to uh, Brother Cotrington. Proceed. The fourth generation. Loudly and clearly. This fourth generation witnessed a number of phenomena within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. One was the development of a liberal Adventism, of a liberal Adventism in contrast with mainstream lukewarm conver con con conservatism. conservatism. Right. The other was the publication of a plethora of, of a books. a plethora of books. Plethora of books aimed at downgrading the 1888 messengers while at the same time claiming that the church accepted the 1888 message. This was all part of the acceptance myth. The acceptance myth. myth that the church accepted when in fact they did not. Okay. The, de the denomination continued to expand and to grow in its human achievements and material property, along with the development of many programs to finish the work. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the 1888 <laughs> message study committee issued a third invitation to the general conference to re-examine the 1888 message, repent, and accept it. The Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference met with the 1888 message study committee over the period 1995 to 2000. At the end of those meetings, their positions remained unchanged. The church maintained the false claim that the 1888 message was never rejected by its leader. Wow. So four generations gone. Human machinery to finish the work. You had, I remember at Barcelona, you had a thousand days of reaping. You had this, the next. And it was while we were in a short war in Africa with those programs that they sat down and said, can't work, something wrong. And they prayed and God, God led them to the 1888 message and they took an airplane and went back to America and confronted the General Conference. 
And then in Australia, at Avondale College, uh, a big search went on and they found the Jones Wagner messages. And so you had many FP right and those starting in Australia. All around the world, people rose up saying, something is wrong, let's get back to that message. And that's how we formed groups and independent groups started. Okay? Well, this history is very important for the young people. Because when, when a generation arises that don't know how it starts, so they can tell it how to end. You hear what I tell you? Easy, so. All right. Brother Andrew, why are you in and out of my class? You went to? Okay. Page 74. Page 74. We get in deep now. So that is, read over those four generations in terms of the synopsis of what happened. Generation one, let me hear the timelines quickly. Generation one was 1844 to 1884. And what happened there? Lukewarmness that would not be cured. Generation two, heaven was very gracious. What happened in generation two? Very early, 1888 message, and God intended to wrap up the work in a flash. That was rejected. Generation three, God again sent a second call through, through uh, Wilina Short. That was made light of, and then you had the compromises with Barnhouse and, Wal and uh, Martin. And then generation four. Uh, hmm? No. No, come, come. What's, what's, what's the first generation and the second generation mismanaged? The third and fourth can't make it. That's why Jesus says if I come at the second watch or third watch. So even in the watches, that applies. Very important principles. Good. Page 74, mercy indeed. The prophet Joel describes the devoured generations. The prophet Joel does what? Describes the devoured generation. Somebody find Joel 1 4 and read it loudly for our following audience. It is, read, it is written there. All right, read it for us. Uh, uh, you want to read it? You got to read it loudly and clearly and, and not in a Beijing accent, in a pristine British accent. Are you with me? Good. Let's go. That which the palmer worm have left have the locusts eaten, and that which the locusts have left has the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Very good. So from now on, when you read for me, you have to read like that. You've just set the standard. Good. Notice these devoured generations. Let's look at them again. The palmer worm, and the locust, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar are life stages in the eastern locust. And let me tell you something. Our locust here is nothing compared to that. When those locusts move in clouds, farmers know it is all over. All over. They eat all your crops, and if you don't watch it, they will eat you too. All over. Those eastern locusts. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, you can even handle a monkey. When you show a monkey gone, the locusts don't hear you. They're moving. They're moving till every green thing gone. So that's how the prophet Joel describes it. Let's look at some Hebrew language now. List the four devourers mentioned by Joel. So write in one, two, three, four for me. Number one, palm a worm. All right, now don't move so fast. The Hebrew for palm a worm is gazam, which means to gnaw. You know, gnaw? Eat away easily and smoothly. You don't even know. When somebody have a gnawing abdominal pain, Annoying, annoying pain, that's a Bajan term. It isn't any sharp pain that will make you alarm. You just know something there in quite right. And that's the kind of pain that will trick you. Because you say, well, but it's not bad enough to seek any medical attention. It must be gas. So that's the most common Bajan symptom. It's gas. Okay? You know what it is with Bajans? They have gas anywhere. Or well, we may clap the knee and say it is gas. Okay, now, Gazam is to gnaw. Watch these terms. The second devourer, Sister Rhea, is? The locust. The Hebrew is Arabe, means to swarm. To swarm, that's the swarming stage. 
The third form is the, the canker worm. Or what, this, this is what the canker worm does. It devours. There's no knowing how it gulps down the leaves. And the th fourth form is the caterpillar. It is about now to change into a pupa, so it just cleans up whatever is left, consumes whatever is left. Okay? In other words, when you reach the caterpillar stage, the damage is already done. All the caterpillar is doing is licking the plate, as it were. All over. So let's look at what these mean now in generation one. It means that generation one, the palmer worm was lukewarmness, just gnawing away. People didn't even know that they switched from new covenant to old, gnawing. Generation two was a swarming rejection of the gospel. Generation three, doctrines were devoured, compromised with Martin and Walt and and Walter Martin and Barnhouse. And generation four, well, all that happened in generation four is the caterpillar eat up what was left because all gone. Everything over. So, it flew, so the prophet describes it. And these Hebrew terms are significant. You don't see them in modern translations. You have to go into Young's Concordance and back into the Hebrew and see these terms. Okay. Now, complete the following table. Everybody get right in and complete this table without a single mistake. I'm going to go around the class. The first one is done for you. Generation 1, date 1844 to 1884. The destroyer was the palmer worm. The Hebrew word is gazam, and it means to gnaw. And what does that mean? Lukewarmness gnaws away at gospel experience. The experience was a loss of gospel experience, and that was the Matthew 22. Those who were bidden, they were bidden, they were bidden to the feast. From 1844, they were bidden or called. Okay? Good. But let's go now to... Uh, we have St. Lucian editions in the back. You're very welcome to... We have a whole edition of, uh, in the back, so welcome. So let's go to Shergun Thomas. And uh, the horizontal line below the one you start... Carriage will continue. We go across that line as we go across this line. On the one will be generation, Shergan, two. So put generation two there. And the dates for generation two, Carriage, 1884 to 1924. And what was the destroyer there, uh, twin? Hmm? The locust was the destroyer there. Oh, I forgot the... Locust was the destroyer, and the Hebrew for locust is? Arbe, which means to? Swarm. And that was a rejection of the 1888 message by Jones and Wagner, a swarming rejection of Christ. And the White says that she saw that Christ was verily rejected, and the disappointed angel went back. All right, experience, therefore, on the experience, what would you put, uh, twin? The other twin? Continue, continue lukewarmness and apostasy. For which one? Rejection of the gospel. Rejection of the gospel. Gospel rejection. And now that was the first call rejected. Okay, they were bidden in generation one. God sent the first call, and they were, that was rejected. Okay, next horizontal line, let's go to Cadisa Newton. Next generation is generation? Three. Three. Timeline, 1924 to 1964. All right, what was the destroyer there, Carissa? Canker worm. The canker worm. Hebrew. Is that Yale? And the Hebrew? Is that Yale? Yeah, yelek. Means to devour. And that means to? Devour. Devour. What happened then? Um, doctrines devoured. Important doctrines like the nature of Christ mm -hmm. and the atonement. So let's fill in under the meaning. Doctrines devoured one. 
1950 rejection of the call to repentance mm -hmm. and accept the native message. This call was given by Wheeling who was that call Sharp. given by? Wheelan and Sharp. Wheelan and Sharp. And two, the doctrine of apostasy on what? What are the two apostasies? Um, the human it, nature of, of Christ, Christ and, and Christ's the administration in the most holy place. Apostasy of the on the nature of Christ, of Christ in the incarnation Christ. and, and the atonement. In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And what call was that then that was rejected? The second call rejected. The second call rejected. Everybody with me? You, pardon? You mean you copy it yet? You covered? You all covered? Okay. Do you have? You have a second call rejected? Okay. All right. And then there's generation four. Generation four, timeline for generation four. Uh, John Ford, huh? Uh, microphone. Caterpillar. The time, generation four timeline. This. 1964 to? 2004. 2004. And what is the uh, devour? The caterpillar. And what is the caterpillar doing? Consuming. Consuming. Just in what we would call licking the plate. Like when you're last in the line, uh, you just get the things to clean up the rears. Everything damaged already. Pardon? Pass the mic, please. Pass the mic. I just wanted to know how you pronounce the CH word for number four, the Hebrew word. The Hebrew, the Hebrew word. How do you pronounce the Hebrew word? You didn't pronounce it. The Hebrew word. Yeah. That Hebrew word. Right. You can ask your father for confirmation. He's the linguist. I'm not a linguist, but this is Chaziel. 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 Okay. To consume. So everybody has completed this table. So all these tables that you complete in this workbook, commit to this computer. Learn them. Okay. Top of page 75. Top of page 75. You want to finish this lesson in a couple minutes. Let's go. Let's go. Top of page 75. It's approaching... Is approaching 5.30? Right. Don't forget, we're going right down to sunset. So we're making this board. Let's go. Page 75. Read for me. Pass the microphone to uh, Sister Ford. Read for me Exodus 25, sowing and weeping. Exodus 25. Exodus 20, verse 5. Exodus 20, verse 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Good. Read that paragraph for us now, Sister Ford. Iniquity sown in the first generation if not remedied in the second, is visited upon the third and fourth generation. The lukewarmness of generation one would have been cured by the 1888 righteousness by faith message. That message was rejected, leaving the third and fourth generation to reap increasing apostasy, well thinking and saying that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Revelation 3.17. What a sad state of affairs. You see how the mechanisms work? Lukewarmness sowed in generation one. God sent the cure in generation two. 
that cure rejected. So generation three and four reaped. But even while they were weeping in generation three, God sent back the cure, rejected again. So generation four, all over. He always sends two calls. He calls, he bids you and then sends two calls. You asking a question about the show again? Uh, microphone, microphone, microphone. If we don't get it this generation, that means we would have to wait 160 years again? No. If we don't get it within these two generations? Uh, according to how cycles go, this generation is the generation that it will happen. I'm okay. saying, if it does not happen, if it does not if happen, we are not ripe in this generation and the next one. You know this generation is? Let me hear the timeline of this generation. 2004 to 2044. Yeah. This is the last generation. This, this, this first generation, the new cycle, that's it. If you want to put if, you can put if. But this is it. All right. Uh, he asks if, 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 we mis if we mismanage this generation, what will happen? The if is, well, we have to go to the next generation. But we don't want that if. Okay. <clears throat> All right, restoration is promised. Let's finish off this lesson. Restoration is promised. Yes, Jada. Pass the mic to Jada. I will let Jada keep the mic for a while. You said that after the first generation in the second cycle, after that is done. So, 2044. So I ask you how you know that. How I know what? That this generation is the last generation. You heard what I said, Shogun? Oh, let me repeat it again. Well, if we mismanage, well then, you will have to go to our next generation, which is 2044 to 2084. That's an if. I'm saying that I have the firm conviction that in this generation, God's people will wrap it up. Okay. Okay. Mm? But all that was implied. Okay. Restoration promised. Joel 2.25, uh, Jada. You've read the mic, so you have to continue. Jada, Joel 2.25. Chiki will read that for us. Pass it back, Mike. Yes. Joel 2.25. And I will restore to you the Everybody years. follow? This is the restoration. And watch, the, yes. watch how the restoration goes in comparison to the degradation. Let's go. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I, which I sent among you. All right, good. Now watch it. What was the order of degradation, Sister Tayan? What was the order of degradation? Palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar. Locust, canker, canker worm, worm caterpillar. caterpillar. What is the order of restoration in Joel 2.25, Carissa? Locust, canker worm, caterpillar, and palmer worm. Okay, so you're starting with the locust. And what does that mean? What, what? What the locust represented, locust represented gospel rejected. So you start there. You have to accept that true gospel of the 1888 message. Once that is accepted, the canker worm change of doctrines will be corrected. You will have the true nature of Christ and understand the atonement. And then, was, was the next correction? And then lastly, Pamo ah, so notice, in God's reversal order, the gospel comes, corrects doctrines, and lastly, there will be victory over lukewarmness. You see the reversal order? The degrad degradation started with the palmer worm. The cure will start with the palmer worm being cured last because they have the gospel to cure it. So? So I want this table filled in now. I want this table filled in now. Anybody operating now? Anybody operating the video? I, I can't, if I move, they can see me. 
All right, so let's fill in the tables now. Order of degradation and order of restoration. So everybody should be flowing. One, palmer worm, lukewarmness. Two, what was two? Uh, locus, gospel rejection. Three, uh, carriage, canker worm, which is doctrines devoured. And four, shurgan, caterpillar. You just, uh, what the caterpillar did? Just consume the rest. Eat up what's left, because I got it ready to, to change into pupa or chrysalis. It doesn't need much eating to do, because it already developed all the damage done. Yes, right. Very good point. So that's the order of degradation. You following uh, Curdell? You have the order of degradation. Palmer worm, locust, canker worm, caterpillar. Palmer worm is lukewarmness. Locust is gospel rejection. Canker worm, doctrines devoured by compromise. And caterpillar, well, the damage finished. You just eat the rest. Yes. If it said lukewarmness was entrenched, that is not correct. For which one? For the caterpillar. For the caterpillar? Yeah. Lukewarmness, uh, you will have to put lukewarmness and apostasy I, entrenched. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going beyond lukewarmness now. Uh -huh. You reject the gospel and change doctrines. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Okay. Or the order of restoration, Gabrielle. Uh, Sister Gabrielle, order of restoration. Locust, locus. acceptance of gospel. Two. The canker worm, which is where the doctrines canker are. Canker worm, which means? The doctrines are corrected. Which means what? The doctrines are corrected. Uh, the doctrinal diff the doctrinal changes corrected. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, the caterpillar. Correct. Doctrinal changes. Three. Uh, Tayan. Caterpillar. Caterpillar. The caterpillar. Um, no more compromise. Which means. No more compromise. Hmm? I have no more compromise. No more compromise. Okay, that's that's okay in your own words. No more compromise. And four, Sister Jada. In the order of restoration. The palm worm. The palm worm is the last thing, correct? Which means victory over the warmness. So by the time we reach the stage of the air, the last thing that is overcome is victory over lukewarmness. So you caterpillar no more compromise. Caterpillar means no more compromise. You, you, you accept the gospel, you correct damage, you're not compromising, you're looking to surrender and get victory over lukewarmness. Lukewarmness cured. Madam Technology. Uh, Madam Technology, this is becoming rather burdensome. So I'll be switched to a normal mic after this session. I'll enjoy it to the end. Yeah. The bottom of page 75, uh, who will read for us now? Uh, one of the twins in a rich St. Lucian accent. Make it clear to the Russian audience or the British audience or the American audience who might be listening. Let's go. Foundation of Restoration led in the field. The heading is Foundation. Foundation of restoration laid mm -hmm. in the third and fourth generations. Good. The line and short, the 1888 re-examined book was circulated in the 1960s and stirred up interest in the Jones and Wagner's messages. Similar mess. Simil similar. Similar uncovering, uncovering of, of the, the messages, messages in Australia in Australia produced a similar result. As the 1888 message reached more and more and more church members, it caused a, a agitation with the increased enthusiasm for study. Right, it caused this agitation and with increased enthusiasm for, for study. study. Okay, all right. Uh, but the question to read on. This was met. This was met with steady resistance by church leadership, leading to the formation of independent ministries. Moreover, the true light of, on God's character began to be progressively revealed in the 1970s. 
1888 to 1885 message of the covenant and righteousness by faith and the character of God message constitute the ripening messages to prepare God's people for the harvest. Everybody got that? The message on the covenants and righteousness by faith, the true gospel, which was the beginning, and the character of God with the advancing light, make up the ripening messages to prepare God's people for the harvest. Now we come to something very important as we close. Everybody focus now. Our movement of reformation started in 1984. How many people here as young people were born yet? Carissa, when were you born? 19? 10 years since of that. When were you born, Gabriel? No? 19? 1997, later yet. When were you born, Cherish? 93. The twins? Hmm? 89. Uh, Karaja? Huh? 91. Shurgan? Huh? 88. Okay. That's a good age difference. <laughs> All right. Good. So, watch this now. State again the time frame of the fourth generation. Write it down. Fourth generation was 1964 to 2004. All right. State the time frame of the second watch of that generation. 1974 to 1984. State the midnight point of that generation, October 1984. And exactly at that point, we were formed. Our first meeting at Farley Hill, as the agitation broke on the character of God, was in October 1984. And as you see these things unfolding, uh, cycles and watches, you also see the significance of the month October. And I'm not mentioning that because I was born there. This is, this is, this is facts. This is facts. So why, why are you laughing? You did with facts. Okay. Hmm? 22nd of October. But no, we, no, we, uh, this meeting here? Yeah. For me? I was born October 4th. I'm talking about this meeting here. It was October. Two meetings at Farley Hill. One around the same 22nd and one at the 31st. Good. So the last two paragraphs before we take a break and come back are significant. So our ministry, listen carefully everybody, young people especially, young people. So our ministry was called into existence in October 1984 at the end of the second watch, 1974 to 1984, of that fourth generation, 1964 to 2004. Our mandate was, and still is, to accept, believe, and experience and proclaim the messages of the true gospel and the character of God, and to walk in and be ripened by the advancing light which shines from the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Our mandate is to get ripe, not do a lot of things that people want to be done. Get ripe. Get ripe. And then the Lord will use us to give you love. Okay? okay? All right. Uh, let me ask you a question. You can enjoy one more chapter. We got an hour or so before, 40 minutes before uh, we do some of it. Or we, we can start 12, and tomorrow we should, be, we, should, we should be able to easily finish tomorrow. But we can start 12 now, finish it tomorrow morning, and we'll have 13 or 14 for the afternoon, which should be easy pickings. Let's pray and take a break. Thank you, dear Lord, for what we, were what we have accomplished. And bring us back in a couple of minutes to persevere in Jesus' name. Amen. Get up and stretch those legs, especially ladies. Said, no, it's not good for ladies. You can get deviant clots. Drink some water and we come back and start 12. Praise the Lord.